We did not start a program on the assumption that we had all the answers about nursing and now had to tell them to somebody else. It was that we could uncover opportunities to get to better care delivered by nurses as we made the case through rigorous evidence that nurses are central to delivering high value, high quality care. Inquiry has paid as much attention to how it is that we get to new knowledge as it has with how it is that we can make knowledge have an impact in the real world. That understanding which nurses always had um, is something that the inquiry program is trying to kind of move up to the next level, move it from intuition to evidence basically. I think the interdisciplinary nature of it is very important too. It's not just nurses studying nurses and patient outcomes, but it's our other partners and other disciplines, researchers from those disciplines working with us um, to also give us their perspective on how we can best um, develop and, and conduct this rigorous research. Preventing falls in hospitals is a team intervention. One of the big problems we found was that the communication in, in hospital settings can be variable. So we saw that nurses routinely do fall risk assessment in the hospital, but the degree to which they communicate the results of that assessment and the interventions that are needed for each particular patient to the patient and across all the team members was, was quite variable. And so by having these tools, what we were able to do is uh, find a way to take that nursing fall risk assessment and put it in the workflow so it was available for the whole team. Just wanted to talk to you a little bit about your um, fall risk in the hospital. When we talked to patients and their family members who had fallen in the hospital, what they told us was that they were hearing from their nurses that they were at risk for falls, but they didn't really believe it because uh, they didn't see themselves at risk and they weren't given reasons why they specifically were at risk. And so, again, using the same fall risk assessment, we generate a patient level of literacy single page handout that tells that patient why they are at risk and what they can do with the team to prevent a fall while they're hospitalized. Even patients who are at low risk, if they have any risk factor present, we have an obligation as their care team to identify interventions to mitigate that risk. And that's what our toolkit did, is it did that automatically for them. That was the main change that came across the care team, is realizing that standard one-size-fit-all interventions don't work. This study really focuses on helping nurses, pharmacists, and other care delivery people in hospitals move beyond a fall risk score and think about risk factors that patients have and then select interventions specific to those risk factors. If someone has gait issues, we are asking people to really think about, do they need a physical therapy referral? Are we getting people up three to four times a day to walk? You will see in some of the patient rooms a big whiteboard in which the patient's fall risk factors are actually listed for that patient. Uh, we developed a set of quick reference guides. They all have huddles, um, either at change of shift or sometime during the day, to talk about what patients are at risk for falls. Now they really are engaged in, I don't want this patient falling and here's what I'm doing about it. So we put together a study to better investigate whether rural hospitals were using the best uh, heart failure practices and decided that really the best approach for an initial study was to use a quality collaborative approach to help rural hospitals implement best heart failure practices. 
and also to link with colleagues about how can we really make it happen here? How can nurses make a difference right here in the rural setting? It was absolutely amazing because once they were using the tools and understanding the power that nursing has to help make care better for these practice environments, nurses engaged. Patients who come to spine surgery and other big interventions may tend to think that the surgery or other kinds of treatment are a magic bullet that are going to solve their problems. And in fact, an issue as complicated as back or neck pain, like many other conditions, is really largely in the hands of the patient. We devised a brief intervention to assist patients after spine surgery in managing their own pain. So the wheel has issues on it like activity, medication, exercise, sort of the activities that can affect back pain, and patients can use the color wheel to say which of those activities is the most important to them. For example, it's good to be outside, it's good to get away from your desk, it's good to take a walk, the act of smiling can lift mood. You can try the technique of stopping and taking two deep breaths. So it's setting the patient up for success rather than failure, and it's putting the decision about how much to do and what kinds of things to do in the hand of the patient. The reason that I initiated this study was really based on work that I'd done in the prior 15, 20 years, looking at motivation in older adults, motivation around engaging in functional activities and physical activity. I've always been a firm believer that's important to both maintaining health and quality of life, and we well know that in the majority of Americans, let alone older Americans, people don't engage in enough physical activity. With older adults, it also involves function. And so seeing this and seeing what was going on first in rehab facilities and nursing homes and then in assisted living, as assisted living began to grow, I really came to notice that, oh my gosh, it's even worse in assisted living. If you live here, this is the philosophy here. We're not here just to put your shoes on. We're here to help you maintain that ability yourself. The function-focused care approach is a perfect fit with nursing and actually where nursing is going today because I believe it helps nurses to work at their full scope. Nurses can follow orders, but they can also work to optimize the individual's function and physical activity because of the impact that has on their overall health. We spend the most time with that individual and time is what's needed here. When people are discharged from the hospital, and they come into home care, there's always many discrepancies between what the patients actually report taking in the home and what it says they should be taking on their medication discharge list. And in fact, they often have several different lists, one that the home care nurse gets from the hospital, one that the patient gets from the hospital, maybe one that they had before hospitalization, and they all have multiple different medications that the patient's supposed to be taking and they don't match up. So our goal with this study was to try to help home care nurses efficiently identify those differences and resolve them to try to prevent rehospitalizations and emergency room visits related to adverse drug events. We have a pharmacist who has a clinical practice where he goes into the home to visit patients and do medication consultation with the patients right in their home. These are generally really high-risk patients and they have lots and lots of medications and lots of questions about their medications. And the best place we think for somebody to use those skills that they've developed as a pharmacist and the knowledge that they've gained 
is in the home talking to patients about what they take on a daily basis. After we interviewed nurses and we got their descriptions of the kinds of things they do to identify errors, we then developed a little instrument that would help to measure that. And we went and we surveyed nurses on 82 medical surgical units across 14 hospitals. And we asked them about the frequency with which they engaged in these practices. And we also asked them about other things concerning their work environment. And what we found was that a constellation of four of these practices, the ones that we considered that were key interception practices, having a doctor rewrite a medication if they couldn't read, it, read the order properly, asking why is the patient receiving this medication and doing that critical thinking, independently going back to the physician's orders and the record at the beginning of their shift and making sure that the medications that were listed on their record matched what was in the patient record. So these kinds of practices that nurses engaged in were associated significantly with fewer medication errors that reached the patient across the 82 units. So the work environment, which is one in a hospital setting particularly, noisy, many distractions, and whenever your attention is diverted, there could be a danger there. And some of it is really back to the basics. So simply reminding nurses that while you're preparing and administering medications, decrease the interruptions as much as possible. Checking the patient's ID, making sure they do the med check against the medication administration record. The nurse asking the patient if they understood the medication. Signs on the wall reminding others that when a nurse is preparing their medications to not interrupt or disturb them. And there's really no one in between the nurse and the patient to assure that the nurse is doing it correctly. There is something actively taking place there where people are saying, hey, we're going to focus on culture. We're going to talk about communication. We're going to empower nursing and medicine as a team. Although we've known for years that delirium is a really big problem in the intensive care unit, up until the last decade or so, we really had no appreciation for how devastating this disorder could be on a person and their family. So meaning that if people experience an episode of delirium while they're in the hospital, they're at much higher risk for having long-term problems in their cognitive ability. The actual intervention that we're studying is called the ABCDE bundle. And the A in the ABCDE is awakening. The B is breathing. C is coordination, D is delirium, and E is early mobility. So really getting these patients up out of bed um, almost the day of, if not the next day of admission, um, is so important. It's important for a number of reasons. I mean, obviously it's going to do things like protect them from getting bed sores and prevent them from getting pneumonia, but also um, transforming the way we used to think about normal, normal care delivery in the ICU. That nurse is really like a guardian angel. She's protecting the patient from all the harms that surround what we do when patients are sick. So at all levels, the goal here has been to say, who is it we need to be bringing around the table today to help uh, nurses position themselves for making an impact today? And I think that that's been one of the great joys of this program. Great minds, great scholars, multidisciplinary perspectives on big issues, bringing those individuals together with the people right from the beginning who are going to uh, make decisions about how to use that knowledge. I think for nursing, it's been a great story, but most importantly, it's been an extraordinarily important story for the people that we serve. <laughs>